Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Thank you for uh, for this beautiful day. We thank you for doing all the watering with the heavy rains last night, so that we could gather in this beautiful place that testifies of your goodness and your greatness. Mm-hmm. And we ask you now to send your Holy Spirit. Pray that you use Pastor Izzy as a vessel to speak to each one of us today, that we would grow ever closer to you. We ask that now in Jesus' name. We pray, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, guys, would you turn in your Bibles to First John chapter two? We're going to continue our study in First John. In this gorgeous uh, setting, you know, um, someone asked me where the when I when I s- talk about how the heavens are telling of the glory of the Lord, and, um, and how his how his um, uh, you know the expanse. It says the great expanse is declaring his handiwork, and they were asking me where is that verse? That, that's Psalm 19, or whoever it was that asked me last week. Psalm 19, verse one. Um, someone was asking, where's that? I hear you say that sometimes during the praise time, how all of creation is testifying of, of the glory of our God, his handiwork. And, uh, and Psalm 19 and Psalm 119, if you want to, that's the longest psalm, but in the Psalm 119, it also talks about how, just look around, all that is made, we have the best, I, I love it because I've am i got the I've got the best teacher's aid I could possibly have. Everyone, look at it. We cleaned the windows for you. Look at our wallpaper. See our, our father's handiwork. This is, I don't worship creation. I worship the creator who made all this. But when I see what he has made, I just think, oh, what a beautiful day he's given us. And, and it just, I don't know, a- any of you, one of the, uh, the outdoor type folks, that when you get out in nature, you see his handiwork, you feel closer to God? There's a reason for that because you're just, you're, your spirit is, is identifying that God indeed has made magnificence in all the, all the things around that he has created. And there's something in our spirit that is drawn to that greatness. His, his touch, his, it's like his fingerprints are all over the things around us when we get out in nature and we see what he has made. And so, so that's where I got that, that, um, that particular scripture, whoever it was that asked me last week. Psalm 19, verse 1 and 2, just, just for you to get your highlighter out and, uh, and mark that. But today we're going to turn now to, to 1 John chapter 2 and continue studying this wonderful, it's a short little epistle, little letter that, that John wrote to the, to, the, to the believers. And he was writing... This is one thing I have to tell you I really admire about the the little this little epistle of 1 John is John does not hide why he is writing. He's very straightforward, f- he's forthcoming with this is why I am writing these things to you. And I I don't know if you've ever been at a service where the preacher's preaching and you're kind of wondering what's this guy's motivation? You know, what is he, is he trying to get something from me? Is he, what, what is he, you know, why is he doing this? And, and when you don't know, it kind of hinders you from hearing the whole message because your mind's so busy trying to discern what is this guy's angle or why is he doing this? And John, I can tell, had been a pastor for a long time. So while he's teaching to this, you know, I call it teaching, while he's writing this letter to them, he doesn't even make them wonder why he's writing. He tells us the the reasons that he writes his letter as he goes along. You know, and sometimes, I don't know about you, does that help anybody here besides me that he tells why he's writing these things so you know? You know, like, some of you ask me, why do you teach the Bible? And uh, the Bible tells us that there there are certain individuals God gives a gift of his Holy Spirit called a pastor teacher. I'm one of those guys. Not a real preacher kind of guy. Those of you guys have been with me a long time, you know that. I teach through the word. But I get to lead a lot of people to the Lord just by teaching his word. And, but I, even, even on top of that, I get the privilege of building up the believers that are already in Christ. I get to help strengthen their faith. And the Bible says that our job is to be a helper of your joy. That's A, a true minister of the gospel will help your joy increase 
He will be there to help strengthen you in your faith. And you remember in 1 John chapter 1, where he wrote in verse 4, the, the r- first reason that he says these things we write to you, what was the reason that he wrote? He said that they were writing. We write that your joy would be, well, our joy would be what? Made complete, full. That we would have a fullness of joy. Now, it, for those of you that have n- never been around um, Christians that have no joy, anybody here run into a few of those? They exist. I hate, to, I hate to report that they exist, but they do. And the problem with the Christians that have no joy is, um, well, you know, you're like, what? Uh, didn't you say you're a Christian? I am. <laughs> Are you okay? No. I mean, yes, I'm fine. Praise God. And you're like, whoa, I don't know if that's really heartfelt, but, you know, the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our what? It's our strength. And a lot of Christians are struggling, feeling weak, because they don't understand that joy of the Lord. You know, Jesus says that he gave us these things of his spirit. He said, my peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. He says, not as the world gives do I give to you. I I give you my peace. Now, his peace differs from the world's peace. I've shared this before, but, you know, in the world, when someone says, I just want to be at peace, their definition of peace is is like what Webster describes peace, absence of conflict. That's the Webster's definition, for number one, on peace, absence of conflict. But that's not, that's the world's peace. Jesus' peace is different. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives. His peace isn't an, a, a, an absence of conflict, but rather an assurance that he will be with you through the conflict. It's a huge difference. He said, in this world, by the way, I skipped the first part of that quote because it gives it away. In this world, you shall have what? No conflicts, right? No. You shall have tribulation, which means plenty of conflicts, right? Mucho conflict. That's what, that's, that's, that's what tribulation is, trials. It's a lot of conflicts. But see, we have to... You know what's so nice about having the Word of God here to, to, to point us to the, to the Word with a capital W, the Word of God, Jesus, is that this scripture here points to Jesus and says, look at him. Because remember when David wrote Psalm 23? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I, I fear no evil for thou art what? With me. Even if you're going through... And, and I don't know if you've thought of this, but the valley of the shadow of death. That's pretty descriptive, isn't it? Is that a nice place to take a stroll? <laughs> yeah, I'm just walking, swantering along. The valley of the shadow of death, it's all good. No. It's the bad spot in life. But, but the psalmist wrote, Yea, though I walk through that, I fear no evil for a reason. You know the reason. Because thou art with me. Lord, you are with me. And we need a reminder sometimes that the Lord is with us. You know, some of you, you have aunties or, 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 or grandparents that they spoke into your life when you were just little ones and taught you, don't worry, whatever you go through, honey, someday you, you might be hard, but don't forget, who's with you? The Lord. The Lord will be with you. And that gives you a peace that is not of this world. It's a peace beyond all human comprehension. It, it's a peace that even when stuff's going terrible, your peace is not based on your circumstance. Your peace is based on a relationship between you and your creator who has made a way for you to come to him through his son. He saved you. Jesus is our savior and he is our peace. Isaiah declares, he is our peace but he is also our joy. And joy, like peace, is not based on circumstance. It's based on a relationship between you and your maker. When your relationship with with God is good, you know what that does for your joy? It increases it. In fact, I've noticed that a lot of Christians who struggle with having joy 
usually have, um, well, they don't realize it, but they've allowed sin to creep into their lives. Maybe it was a subtle entry it made, but somehow a little bit of sin has, has crept in and has taken root. And the reason I know this is because I read Psalm 51. You know that psalm what David wrote after he sinned with Bathsheba? And we sing it sometimes, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Right? Cast me not away from thy what? Thy presence, O Lord. Take not thy holy spirit from me. And then he says something. He says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Right? Create in me that clean heart. Restore, renew a right spirit within me. David understood when he sinned that something happened to his joy. That joy that he had when he, the joy of our son. How many of you remember the day you accepted Christ into your life? Was that a joyful day? When you, I don't know about you, but I remember the day that I, I finally surrendered. And I, I'm not going to tell you I was the easy kid. I, I went kicking and screaming against the things of the Lord. I was fighting but when I finally surrendered, this strangest thing, I mean, a peace came over me that I can't even describe. And a realization that my sins were forgiven began to sink in. They were actually removed through what Jesus did. And boy, all of a sudden, I was like, I can't tell you how good I feel. I mean, there's, a f there's like a weight has been lifted from my, from my being. I... I feel so great. I mean, I'm forgiven. And something went, a little click in my heart, just like, like, like the Grinch, when all of a sudden, you know, he got a little heart for whatever that little Hoosieville girl was, I forget. Yeah, Cindy Hulu or something. All of a sudden, she, you know, his little heart went from stone to click doop, 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 you know. My heart went from dead to all of a sudden, God infused life into it with his joy. It was a joy that was the joy of my salvation, finding out that he died and it counted for me, and that he forgave me, and that all my sins were now washed away. The joy of the Lord began to do a work from the inside out. I can't... It is such a cool thing. How many can identify with this? How God brought his joy into your life when you found out that he did that for you too. When that happens, you're just like, man. Now, when David sinned, all of a sudden he's crying out to the Lord, restore unto me. Don't take away your Holy Spirit, Lord. Don't cast me away from your presence. Don't create in me a clean heart. Restore unto me the joy. What happened to the joy of his salvation? Why do you cry out, restore unto me the joy of my salvation? He lost it. Sin made him lose that joy. And I've, I, I know that there's some Christians, just it's one of those pastoral things you get used to, the idea that even Christians sin. They call you all the time to tell you. <laughs> oh, pastor, you ought to pray for me. I've sinned. They did it again. But one of the things I notice is their joy is usually pegging the real low side of the joy meter. It's gone way down. When they're in sin, the joy is gone. And the strength, that joy of the Lord that is our strength, their strength is in the toilet. Now John is writing this letter, he says, so that our joy would be what? Full. He's not hiding the fact here. I'm writing to you guys so that our, not just your joy, but he says our joy would be full. First reason he gives for writing this epistle. Now today, we're going to come to a part where he's going to give many reasons why he's writing. In fact, specific reasons to specific groups. To the young men, why does he write to them? To the older guys, what's he got to say to them? He's going to give like specific words of encouragement to each of these groups. And I want to show them to you today because... These were some of the things I first read as a young man. And they have helped me. It's kind of scary because I think I'm going to have to be one of the older ones 
in this book pretty soon. But, but when I was young, I didn't read about the old guy. I just skipped over that part. Read to the young guy, what does it say? I mean, did, did you ever do that when you're reading the Bible? Look for what does it say for you? What, what does God have to say for you? He, you know, you, you care about everybody, but when we're reading, who are we really looking to hear about? Us. We want to know what does God want to tell us? This is a living relationship with a living God. I need to know what he wants to tell me. And here this morning, you see, in verse 12 of chapter 2, we read, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven you for his name's sake. The second reason John says he's writing this letter, first, that your, our joy would be full, and second, to let us know our sins have been what? Forgiven for whose namesake? For Jesus' namesake. It's a really important reason to write this letter. I know John was a pastor for a while because only a pastor would throw this in. Why do I have to make sure I put this into the letter? Because there's always some person who doesn't know yet how much Christ has accomplished for us. How complete is his forgiveness. And John just says, I got to write to you, little children, so you will know your sins have been forgiven. Not your sins might be forgiven, would be, could be, if you die on a good day. You might make it in. No, he says your sins have been forgiven. This is something really important to let sink into your being because until you recognize that Christ when he came and he hung on the cross, what was the last three words he said from the cross? It is what? Finished. He finished paying for our sins on that cross. And sometimes we just need to sink into our brain. My sins are already paid for. Payment made by him. Now, he gives another reason he writes, but he doesn't address it to the little children. The little children, you can assume, is to... The new ones in the faith. You know, by the way, new believers in the faith need reminder. Constant reminder that their sins are forgiven. Maybe you're around a new Christian and you're thinking, what do I tell them? You know, I don't know what to Just remind them. Over and over, remind them. How many of their sins are forgiven? All. For whose sake? Jesus' name's sake. That your sin. Just, it helps a new believer become rooted and grounded in the truth of our faith. You know, you might be around someone I'm not get a privilege to be with, but you, you know they just gave their life to the Lord. Tell them this for me. Say, hey, just a quick reminder. Pastor said, just a quick reminder. Your sins are all forgiven. Because a new believer, do they ever struggle with that? You know, some sin that they, they perhaps had going on in their life and they're struggling with, how do I, 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 you know, they feel condemned. And by the way, we know that the devil condemns. In fact, he accuses day and night, it says before God. Did you see? And he points each of us out before God. And we need to remind the new believers, the little children in the faith. Hey, and by the way, some of you are older in the body, but you're still little children in your faith. You're just starting out. Let me assure you, all your sins are forgiven. Now, how about you older ones? Anyone here been in Christ? Let's say, well, what's an adult age? 20 years? 30 years? Who here has been in Christ over 20 years? Raise your hand. Oh, man, I'm preaching to that. Okay, this is for you. It says the fathers, the older ones. Here, I am writing to you fathers because you know him who was from the beginning. Not because you wonder about, is God really there anymore? If you've been a Christian for over 20 years, you pretty much know he's there. It's kind of hard to not know he's there after 20 years of walking in faith, isn't it? You walk in faith for 20 plus years, you know he is there. So John just puts it, matter of fact, I write to you fathers because you know him who was from the beginning. And I'm writing to you young men, listen to this, and young men need to know this, because you have overcome the evil one. Young men wrestle a lot with that evil one, and that evil one tries to sidetrack them. And John says, here's a true pastor's heart. 
Listen y'all up, young men. I'm writing to you because you have overcome. Not you will overcome. You might maybe beat the devil on a good day. No, he says, you have. Young men need to know that they have overcome the evil one. He says, and I've written to you children because you know the Father. One thing about a child of God is they know who is daddy, spiritually speaking. You know, the, the scripture says we cry out by his spirit with our spirit identifying Abba, what? Father. Abba in Hebrew is dada, daddy. We call him Father. He is our heavenly Father. Remember Jesus when he said, they said, teach us to pray, said, our Father which art in heaven. He's our Father. Little children, you know the Father, he says. And then verse 14, and I have written to you fathers again, the same reason, because you know him who has been from the beginning. And I have written to you young men because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. I find that, now some people say, oh, there's a typo. They like doubled up and said the same, he said this almost the exact same thing. No, this is, if you've never been around a Jewish person, a teacher, rabbi, their way of teaching is um, what we call layers. They'll, they'll, they'll set a, a foundation step first, you know, the, the, the foundation step here. I'm writing to you old guys. Why? Because you already know. You know God. You've known him. You've, you've known from the beginning. You, you've been walking with him. But I write to you young men because, well, he said first to them, you've overcome the evil one. But notice in verse 14, he says, I've written to you young men because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. He adds a couple extra things in there for these young men. They are what? Strong. The Bible teaches that it's the glory of the old men, their, their gray hair is their glory. And the glory of the young men is their what? Their strength. I used to have bigger muscles I could have showed you, but I mean, just <clears throat> help out. <laughs> it's the young men that God gives the strength. And by the way, whatever gift he gives you, the glory of wisdom or the strength of youth, what are we supposed to do with those gifts? We submit them to the Lord and we serve him with them. Whatever he grants to us. And John says, he's given you these things. Now John goes on. Now that we know the reasons he's writing, he's saying, guys, just let this sink in. You know him who's from the beginning. You, you older ones, you know the Lord. But listen to the exhortation he gives next. This is an exhortation, probably one of the greatest ones that the church needs today in America. It's found in verse 15. 1 John 2.15 reads, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, he says these things are not from the Father, but they're from the world. And the world is passing away. And also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God will live how long? Forever. Do we have a society based on following the lusts of the flesh? And the, and, and, the, and, the, and the lust of the eyes? The boastful pride of life? We, 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 we well, hey, does it, but it, it if you've traveled the world a bit, you know that Americans are seen as some of the most prideful people on the planet. We're the arrogant imbeciles to other places in the world because we go there and, and we demand that they speak our language. We're in their country, but we want them to speak English. Like, and I if they come from their country to ours, what do we demand? <laughs> we still want them to speak our, ling our language, right? Because we're just so good. It's only us. No other language counts. See, but growing up as a person who didn't speak English as his first language, I always found that quite peculiar. When I grew up in a house, we spoke Italian. We didn't speak English. And I didn't learn English till I went to, to kindergarten. And I, I submit to you that 
it's, you know, you travel somewhere else in the world, it's not really fair of you to act like they have to speak your language. They're in their country. You're visiting. As a visitor, I was told when you visit, you, you're a guest. And, yeah, he, he said, when in Rome, do as the Romans. You're there. If they speak Italian, guess what? You better learn Italian. I'm ahead of you. But, but you can learn. And the, and the thing is, is that this boastful pride of life that is so interwoven through our society, we even have a cultural identity as being prideful people. It's a really sad commentary because the Bible says God is opposed to the proud. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want God opposed to me. I want God on my side. It says, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, Peter wrote. And, and what happens if you humble yourself? He will lift you up. There's a, there's a part of us wired. We want to be lifted up, but, but it doesn't work when we exalt ourselves. We need to humble ourselves before God and let him do the lifting. Because he knows how high we are safe. And how high is too high where we get ourselves a little bit in trouble. And he loves us. And so he says, don't love this world. Don't love the things of the world. Don't love this boastful pride of life. Don't love the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. These are things in this world. But he said these things, these lusts, what's going to happen to all these lusts? And pass away. So all gonna, this stuff's all going to go goodbye. The lust of the eyes. Some guys, they lust after the, 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 the model of car they have. You know? The car is their idol. The, the Harley Davidson, yes, the motorcycle. Whatever the thing is of that they're... Now, there's lust of the flesh. That's when you're lusting after... The, you guys lusting after those gal... Oh, your tongue's all hanging out. <gasps> you know, I... They're, they're like, I'm not lusting. <laughs> you know, like in the cartoon where the guy's eyeballs come out of his head. Wooga, wooga. You know? Hot girl going by. That's lust of the flesh. But lust of the eyes can lust after all sorts of articles. These eyes, the Bible says the eye is never full of seeing. The ear is never full of hearing. Our appetite in the flesh is so voracious. And some people, they want preachers that will preach to them messages that make their flesh happy. You know, things like, and by the way, this is a false teaching. Just I'm going to start it off prefaced with so nobody misquotes. If some guy says, you deserve to have all this stuff. You are a child of the king and he wants you to have six he wants you to have this success of all this material things. Do you know that just over the last couple of decades we've had a false teacher on the mainland going around telling people that Jesus had was really rich when he was on this earth. And that he had six different homes throughout the spread throughout the region of Israel. And this man has a huge television ministry. I read ahead in my Bible at the end here, there's this warning. It says, beware of these false teachers. These men that, that they mer make merchandise of the gospel. And this guy actually says Jesus was rich. It's like he had homes everywhere spread around Israel. Six different homes, mansions. And, and you are a child of the king and you deserve to have a mansion too. And I need another Rolls Royce, so send me your money, he says. And I just want to vomit when I see those guys. It's just like, that is so, you know what Jesus said? Now, I, I'm going to go with, would you rather go with what the scripture teaches or with what this guy, this heretic is teaching on the mainland? Because the Bible teaches that Jesus said, foxes have holes. They got their little hole in the ground, their den. And the birds of the air, they have their nests up there. But the son of man, he said, has what? No place to lay his head. Now, this guy on the mainland saying that Jesus had six homes and the Bible records that he says he had nowhere to lay his head. Which one is correct? Maybe this guy didn't read the book. In fact, that's usually one of the problems with the false teachers. They don't acquaint themselves with the scripture. 
They, they come up with, it says, doctrines which tickle men's ears that make, you know, sound good to the ear. But they don't actually steer their soul to the truth. Now, in the Old Testament, if a prophet prophesied something, and even if what he prophesied came true, the Bible says, and afterwards he said, see, I'm a prophet. I prophesied this thing. It came true. Now, let's go serve Baal. Or let's go serve Ashtaroth. Or let's go serve some other false god. Is that prophet a true prophet because he prophesied something and it came to pass? No. The mark of a true prophet is that he steers you to the true and living God. In fact, if he prophesied something, the sun is going to come up tomorrow. I prophesy it. You know, some guys can do that. And then it happens. And then they say, now let's go serve a false god. I'm a prophet follow me if they do not steer you the true and living god they are a false prophet and if they teach you teachings that jesus was wealthy and he was prosperous on this earth and he wants you to be prospered on this earth and it's all about just your physical comfort i have news for you that's not his words that's not christ's words Christ said, if anyone wants to follow me, go get a mansion, a Rolls Royce, a Mercedes, then I'll let you in, right? No. If anyone, any man wants to follow me, Christ declared, let him what? Deny himself, pick up his what? His cross, and come follow me. What are you going to do with the cross? He's not talking about the little piece of jewelry we've made it into. That's not the cross he's talking about. He's talking about the thing they crucified him. He's saying, pick up your own, well, if we we use today's vernacular, it'd be like, deny yourself, pick up your own electric chair, and come follow me. You know, you're going to get killed, but you've got to bring your own death implement. They're going to kill you. Jesus did not teach us to love this world. He did not teach us to be conformed to this world. He said, be transformed. By the renewing of our minds. Don't, if we get our focus, if some preacher is preaching to you a message that gets you to look at all the stuff down here, but not to the one up there, our creator, the author of our salvation, if he doesn't direct you to him, he's done you a disservice. Oh, maybe that message made you feel wonderful. Got you all hyped. I'm going to get all the stuff down here. but I like the words of Jesus. I just taught this to the college group last night. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of of God and his righteousness. And how many things will be added to you? All the things you need. Your needs, by the way, I know the false teachers say that means all your wants. He didn't say that. He's, you go back and read in that chapter. He's talking about what you eat, what you put on, the stuff you need for life. All that stuff will be taken care of when you see God first. But it's not about this ridiculous idea of seek God so you can become mega rich. Because how many Christians here have sought the Lord to your Christian experience? And any of you have come into mega riches? From your tithing, I can't tell. (laughs) So I just want to know. I do have my master's in finance, but it's kind of a joke. I don't need one to know the economic condition of our country. I have a tithe box. Best, Best economic indicator there is is a tithe box for a pastor. Because all the faithful people, they will tithe as God leads them to Freely, without you, you guys know I don't pass the hat, so it's just up to people to give as God leads them to. And I know that freaks out some people. Somebody wrote to me on Facebook, they couldn't believe that we don't. 20, going on, this July will be 25 years for Jan and I. We have not passed the hat once, okay? In 25 years, not passed the hat. There's been a box, if you want to give, you can freely give. There's no compulsion. We don't want you to give if you feel pressure. There's not, that's, we, we let people give who want to give freely. 
They're like, well, how do you make it? And we go, you got to be kidding. You wouldn't believe how many miracles we get to see every week. And I don't need my masters in finance to know that we're having financial downturns. I could foretell it before we actually started getting it in the, in the CNN World Report news section. Because the, the faithful tithers, they've been tithing. Except the amount they were tithing was about a quarter of what they were tithing a year before. And you know, what has happened to their income? If it's gone down by three quarters, you know somebody has taken a huge pay cut. And see, by having the economic indicator that I have, with tie checks from a bunch of different folks, and all the checks across the board have all gone down, what does it tell me? I forgot to preach on prosperity. <laughs> right? I should have been laying it on them. I should have come up with some, you're a child of the king. And you deserve, just name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. You can have it all, right? I'm, no. If you are one of his children, what does he say? Little children, I write to you so that you will know that you have riches on this earth. Did John say anywhere in here anything like that? No, what does he deal with? I write to you, little children, so you will know that your sin is what? Forgiven. Let's stick to the true substance of this book. God wants to forgive your sin. He's, he didn't go to all this trouble to send Jesus just to make you spirit, or physically prosperous. He went to the trouble to send his son to be the Lamb of God who takes away the what? Sins of the world so that we could have our sin dealt with. And the greatest treasure... The greatest preaching I could ever do would be to point out to you the truest, most, I mean, how much value, how, what dollar amount should I put on all your sins forgiven? How much is that worth? Hey, he says, I haven't made that much. He's 70 years old. That's, a, that's saying a lot. There, how, much could we, how much value will we put on all of our sins being forgiven? The most precious thing Truly, is that God did this amazing work through his son to pay for our sin. And when men try to tickle other men's ears with teachings about stuff down here and don't pay attention to the spiritual message about what God really did for them, that little foo-foo message of make you happy and, 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 and make you feel good is not going to stick with you with, like it will when I teach you what he has truly done to make you have a, a vertical relationship from you up to our Father in heaven that you can cry out, Daddy. You can know him. And those of you that have been walking with him, you already know him. You've been, you've been walking with him long enough. You know the Lord. And he's going, that's my kid. And one of the sweetest things is that we can read this and go, wow. He's telling us, don't love this world. Don't love the things in this world. You know, Jesus said, you, you, you have to choose which master you serve. Now, why don't, why don't those prosperity teachers ever read that verse? Because what did Jesus say? You can't serve God and, what was the other thing? Mammon. R give a, a modern day money, riches. You cannot serve God and riches. You will, it's, it's two completely different masters. You've got to choose which one do you serve. And if you choose to serve money, you can, you can put your whole attention to getting money. I wouldn't recommend it. The proverb says when you do that, the money makes itself have wings and it flies away. Whew. Better to seek the Lord, let him add what you need. And if he should happen to add to you abundant prosperity, which he has done to a few people, I believe he only does it to the ones he knows can handle it. Because sometimes when people get too prospered, they forget the Lord. Did you guys know that in this book, there are more warnings in the Old Testament to Israel, not about, remember to pray when things are bad. Did you know there's not like any verses like that? 
You know what it says? Remember to pray when things are what? Good. When you come into the land and you sit in the house which you didn't build and you eat of the tree which you didn't plant and your life is prospered, remember when you're prospered, what are we supposed to remember? Not to forget who? The Lord. How many times is that admonition given in the Old Testament? Remember, everything happened to them. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 happened to them for whose example? Ours. Remember when things are really good that you don't forget the Lord. Do you know that that message is heralded over and over and over to the nation Israel? Now, everything God spoke to them was for whose example? Mine. He's trying to teach me something. But I never hear the prosperity teachers preach that. They don't get up and say, and when you're prospered, make sure you don't forget the Lord. But see, some people, they get prospered, and that's the first thing they do. Their riches take over their thoughts. Keeping their riches, how will I keep them? i got to hire someone to protect my riches. I'm going to have to put security fence up. I'm going to have to, I, you know, pretty soon they're, they went from being the nicest person on the block to where they have this co compound with gates and guards and, you know, electric fences and nobody in, nobody out. They don't trust anybody. You know, you don't have to worry about having your friends over your house when you don't have much. <laughs> because they might forget something and leave you something. Uh, forget their phone. Hey, I got a phone. You know? But when you have a bunch of stuff, and I've seen this with the wealthy, all of a sudden they're worried about, I don't know if I can trust that person, if I should have them. I mean, we better make sure someone's at the house when they come by to clean the pool or, you know, because I'm not sure that that pool cleaner would be honest enough to, he might leave with extra stuff and... And all of a sudden, your mind has to start thinking about how to guard your stuff. Anyone here know some folks that are kind of well-to-do? One of the first things that most of the, the fi super financially successful folks in our country begin to experience is what we call isolation. They can't trust anybody. Why are you being my friend? When they weren't rich, friends were their friends because, well, they like to hang out. Now they're like, why do you want to hang out with me? You just want to hang out with me for my money. Oh, you just probably want some. What do you want? You know, and, and no more is there relationships down here just because, well, because you can, because you're friends, because you just hung out. And see, some people, and the, the Proverbs writes about this, many, they go astray because they, they, they have this longing to get rich. And no one explains to them the the. the the backside of these riches, what pains it brings. If you can receive it, Jesus knew what he was teaching his disciples to pray when he said, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. High and lifted up is your name. And thy kingdom come, thy, what, what is it? You guys know this prayer. Right? Thy will be done on earth. As is in and what's the next part? Give us this day our annual riches. Right? Just give me enough bread, Lord, today for a whole year. I won't bug you for a year, I promise. Is that what it said? No. But if you listen to these preachers preaching these messages, they're telling you to ask God for more than a year's bread. Ask Him for 10 years, 100 years bread. You won't have to bug God for the rest of your life. Wait a minute. Do you think Jesus would have taught us to pray that way if that's how we were supposed to pray? What did he say? Give us this day our what? Daily. Our daily bread. Why just one day? So we'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> Why when they went out into the wilderness after they came out, they were following Moses in the wilderness? You brought us out here to die. There's nothing to eat. And the Lord said, don't worry, Moses. Tomorrow there'll be food on the ground all over. And in Hebrew, they call it manna, which is, what is it? There's like white stuff all over the ground, and it says it was like coriander milled, but it was, had the taste of, of mild honey. And they gathered it up, and they made manapuas and banana pancakes and whatever else they could come up with, manashevitz, I don't know. <laughs> Malasada, she said, that's not as good. 
But they ate this stuff, and, and do you guys know how much could they gather each day? Only enough for that day. What happened if they gathered more? They said, I don't want to gather tomorrow, I'm going to double up. It would get worms and meals, and it would, it would, it would uh, spoil. And God would not let it last for two days. Except, except once a week. On Friday, the day of preparation. See, Saturday was the Sabbath, the day of rest. So on Friday, you could double up on your manna gathering. And only on Friday would Friday's basket of manna do Friday and Shabbat, Saturday. You were covered for those two days. Then come Sunday, guess what? Go back out and get some more. Why did he want to do that to Israel, you think? Why did every single day God say, I'll supply what you need every day? And how many years did he do it? But just, just for, you know, like driving home the point. How long did he do this? Only 40 years. Every day for 40 years to an entire nation, he fed them day by day by day. Give us this day our daily bread. When we pray that, guys, we, if you can receive it, that's not a bad prayer. That's God taking care of what you need today. And sometimes, if you can just understand, he might know more than you do. If he gave you more than today's portion, it would just spoil on you. It would just ruin something. You, you begin to rely on it instead of relying on who? See, what was he trying to teach them? A daily reliance upon his provision. Some of you say, how do you make it if you don't take up the offering every day or every week? Guess who I had to learn to, to rely on? The guy who has groceries delivered in the middle of the week from some tourist that was just visiting. Oh, pastor, we were visiting and, well, we went to Costco and, and you know, we're only two of us, but, but it was a lot cheaper to just buy the 18-wheeler pack. You know what that is, right? That's the toilet paper. That, you know, the 18, the, the big, they, they, they go, it was cheaper to buy the 18 pack at Costco than to go buy the four pack at Safeway. So we went ahead and bought it there and, and well, we only used two rolls. So, um, and, and I, I laugh because on the refrigerator, on our, on our, you know, the grocery list, stuff to pick up, number one, TP, that's our shorthand for toilet paper. And I just go, and they go, hope you don't mind. I'm like thinking, you open it for me. They're like, oh, sorry, it's open. So what? I had to tear it open anyway, you know? It's the same brand we buy, Kirkland, you know? And the Lord does this all the time, and, and he has taught me daily reliance upon him is not a bad thing. It's actually a very healthy spiritual thing, but it's something that our society doesn't want to do. Because we have a boastful pride of life that opposes the idea that someone else would help take care of us like God. We want to be self-made, take care of ourselves. God helps them that helps themselves, right? Isn't that a scripture? By the way, no, it is not. And more scripturally in this book, since I have had the privilege to teach every single chapter, every single verse, all the way from cover to cover and back around the horn again to this fellowship, I can, I can tell you for certain this book actually teaches the exact opposite. God helps those who cannot help themselves. In fact, spiritually, while we were yet sinners, the Bible says at the right time, Christ died for us. The just for the unjust. The godly for the ungodly. He came and died and paid for our sins when we couldn't do anything about it. So if that goes against your pride, sorry. Swallow your pride. You don't need it. You need to be humble and say, I could use that. Because that's where your joy will begin to start. When you receive a gift that God wants to give you, the gift of forgiveness of your sins, the complete removal of all your sin. He went to a lot of trouble to pay to get our sins washed away. Cost him his son. 
is a huge price. Don't think it was cheap. It cost him his own son to pay for our sins. But we have to just say, okay, Lord, I'll accept what you have. And if you're in a place, maybe you're in a modest financial place, you're, you're struggling. You're, by the way, John Higgins would tell you, the pastor that mentored me, you're in a great place. John always looked at things as, as what place are they in for their spiritual growth? Not, not, he didn't really, you know, when you've been a pastor like 40, 50 years, you don't really look at their physical comfort anymore. At least he didn't. He'd be like, you're in a great place. And you'd be like, I'm struggling. I'm suffering. I don't even know if I'm going to have money to make the rent. I'm just, we're barely scratching by and, and we don't even know what we're going to eat next. And he'd be like, you're in a great place. Now, that's not what the prosperity teachers would tell you. But a man who's walked, one of those older fathers who knows him, would know that you are spiritually in a great place. Why? Because when you're in that needing place where you need God to come through, and you go to him and say, God, I need you to come. I need you. How hard is it for him to pull off something? You know, creator of the universe author of salvation, alpha and omega, omnipotent God, all-powerful, omniscient, he, all-knowing. He, he has all these qualities. How hard is it for him to get groceries delivered? How hard is it for him to give you your daily bread? It's a piece of cake. That's what we need to hear about when we go to church, that we serve a God that forgave our sins and that knows what you need every day. He knows what you need. That's why Jesus said, ask him each day. And you don't have to ask for more than that. In fact, the Bible teaches us not to worry about tomorrow. It's in that same passage about uh, seek ye first and all these things. In fact, it's the very next verse, verse 34 of Matthew 6. Don't worry about this stuff because, well, Jesus said, don't even worry. Don't be anxious for tomorrow. Today, anyone can give an amen to this. Today has enough cares of its what? Of its own. Just do one day at a time. You know, I, I, I marvel. I see these inspirational, you know, uh, motivational speakers like uh, Tony Robbins. He'll get up and teach this seminar, charge $10,000 to tell you what I'm going to tell you right now for free. Okay, listen up. You could pay 10 grand and learn this, but I'll, I'll give it to you for free. I've been to a seminar, got invited up there. And you know what he said? Don't worry about tomorrow. Today has enough problems of its own. We just have to do one day at a time. One day, everybody chant, one day at a time. You know, and he, he gets them all hyped up. One day at a time. They pay $10,000. All these corporate individuals sent from their company to learn how to manage the stress of life, how to prosper. And you know, it's so funny because Anthony Robbins in, the, in recent years gave his life to Jesus. And a lot of his recent quotes, what, he doesn't say, and Jesus said. He just says what Jesus said. I'm like, you ripped that off, you know. But I love to see the people's reactions because the truth is the truth. And he's telling them the truth. You know, you guys are not wired to do tomorrow's worries on today. Anyone can give an amen. Today has enough cares. Amen. Just do today, okay? Quit worrying about tomorrow. And some of you guys quit worrying about the next day and the next day and the next month and the next year. Some of you are like, like light years ahead of us in worry. You're like worried way into the, we're, not, we're only on today. What good does it do to put extra worry from the future to your shoulder now? You're just bearing a weight that you don't need. One day at a time is all you get. You ask this day your daily bread. You do this day the worries of this day. The cares of this. Just what, if, if, if this is all you remember from today's message, you leave here and you go, that pastor said just do this day, one day. Just do this day well. Spiritually speaking. Go this day to God and say, give me what I need this day, God. Forgive me this day my sins. Right? He said to pray that. 
Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who what? Trespass against us. Somebody has sinned against you. What is that saying? By the way, you do want to forgive them, right? Because if you say, forgive me as I don't forgive them, you know what you just prayed, right? Don't forgive me. I know if you didn't think that one through, it's a loaded prayer, right? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those. What if I don't want to forgive them, Lord? Then I ain't forgiving you. But Lord, I want forgiveness. What's he saying? Each day, you got to let it go. You got to let go unforgiveness. You got to cast all your cares on him. And one day at a time, just seek him for whatever it is, that daily bread, that daily portion. Say, God, give me what I need this day. Anyone who's been in the faith, let's say over 10 years, answer this question for me. Is our God a God who takes care of each day? Every day? Has he ever failed? Have we failed? Sure. Does he? Never. The Bible says even if we remain unfaithful, he remains faithful. Don't stress out. We have a very faithful God. Let's do one day at a time this week. Just one day each day. Don't get ahead of yourself, some of you gals, and some of you guys. I know you some of some worry work guys too. Just do today. Okay? That's the word I have for you. Next week, we're going to pick up and see the end of this chapter, John chapter 2, 1 John 2. It's got some beautiful exhortations for us to help us in our faith. And he's not going to hide any reason why he's writing. In fact, the more you start to ponder the reasons, the richer this book will be to speak to your faith. These things he's trying to communicate. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we have these scriptures, these holy scriptures that point us to the true word of life, your son. I pray as we go from here, you would let these things sink into our spirits. Lord, let the, the truths that we have looked at this morning, let them just, well, do that work that you desire them to do, Lord, to refresh us in areas where we need that, a little revitalizing, Lord, of our faith and your ability to take care of us, Lord. We, for our brothers and sisters, any of us here, Lord, that are, that are in need of your provision, we look to you. We ask you, give us this day our daily bread. And Lord, help us forgive those that have trespassed against us so we could have your true forgiveness. We can go from here experiencing the joy of the Lord. Pour that out now into our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.